All right, we should be uh, ready to go. Um, so welcome, Josh Nob. Uh, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Yeah, I'm Josh. Um, I work mostly in the field of experimental philosophy and I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Awesome. Okay. So some of our viewers might not know exactly what experimental philosophy is. And I know this isn't a discussion about getting into all the details of that, but could you just briefly introduce people to what experimental philosophy is? Yeah, sure. So experimental philosophy is a field that's kind of roughly at the intersection of philosophy and psychology. So on one hand, it kind of uses the methods that were typically associated with psychology. And on the other hand, it uses the kind of theories or ideas that are typically associated with philosophy. So if you think about this longer tradition of philosophy, going back to Plato or something like that, you see this approach where people often introduce these kind of thought experiments. They say, okay, consider this case. If you imagine this case, would you say that this is an example of justice or injustice or knowledge or not knowledge, or you know, this person has free will or doesn't have free will? And then for thousands of years, philosophers have been interested in these really interesting patterns that you see in these thought experiments, how changing one factor in these thought experiments can really change people's intuitions around. And philosophers have been using those intuitions to develop much broader theories that shed light on really important questions about human life. And then on the other hand, we have this tradition of psychology where we've developed these methods that where you can run experiments, do statistical analyses, conduct theory, develop theories about what's going on in people's minds that explain those and so forth. And then maybe around 20 years ago, at the turn of the 21st century, there emerged this field, experimental philosophy, that kind of unites those two things. So it's a field that studies people's intuitions about these very traditional kind of philosophical questions, using these very traditional kind of philosophical theories to address them, but at the same time, uses all the methods that you typically see in psychology. So running experimental studies, um, using statistical analyses, developing theories about what's going on in people's cognition and so forth. Awesome. Okay. So uh, going off of one of the things that you mentioned, free will, maybe that's a good place to start. And uh, I think that the general idea is that we're going to work through some of uh, topics of interest that we share. And I think I want to save metaethics for last because that's where, you know, I, I come in with my own interests. And if we start with that, I'm going to end up asking too many questions and talking too much about it. So let's start with a couple other things. Uh, let's start with free will. And I guess the way I would I would frame this is to say, OK, well, um, maybe roughly to just tell people about the philosophical discussion about free will. And then you could you could sort of introduce us to where experimental philosophy steps on the stage, like how it has addressed this particular uh, issue, free will. Yeah, absolutely. So within philosophy, there's been this really long-standing controversy about the relationship between free will and determinism. So imagine we discover some fact about the universe. We discover that this universe is deterministic. So what that means is that everything that's happening right now was caused by the thing that was happening right before that, which was in turn caused by the thing that was happening right before that, and so forth, all the way back to the beginning of the universe. So if we knew what was happening you know, at the time of the Big Bang, just from that and from the laws of physics, we could predict all the way forward to what's happening right now. So this conversation that we're having right now and what we say in this conversation right now, that would be in some way determined by what was happening at, about facts you know, at the very beginning of our universe. Okay, here's the big question. If that turned out to be true, then would that mean that you and I don't really have free will? Would it mean, for example, that we aren't responsible for anything that we're doing, that we can't be blamed for anything that we're doing. And within the philosophical literature, there are two main views about this. One is called incompatibilism. The incompatibilism says free will and determinism are incompatible. So what that means is if the universe turns out to be deterministic, then we can't have free will. We can't be responsible for anything. If I do something bad, you shouldn't think that I really deserve blame for that or responsibility in this deep sense, because being blameworthy or responsible is just incompatible with determinism. And the other view, which is called compatibilism, says these two things are compatible. So it could be that our world physically is deterministic, but also I'm totally morally responsible for the things that I do. Like you might think, for example, it's deterministic, but what's determining it is facts about me, about my own values and so forth. And so you might think, even if you know physicists discover our world is deterministic, that doesn't mean that I can't be held morally responsible for the things I do. And in philosophy, there's a real stalemate between these two positions. There's this sense philosophers have been arguing about this 
for thousands of years, and neither side seems to be getting kind of the upper hand. Okay, so um, so that that basically tells us like where we're at with this dispute. So the dispute is about the compatibilist versus the incompatibilist approaches to free will. So wh- so I guess could you tell tell me a bit about when did experimental philosophers start addressing this? How did they address it, and what have they found so far? Yeah, well, I, I've done some work on this myself, and I'd be happy to talk about that. But the person who really began this is um, the philosopher Eddie Namias. And he and his collaborators, including, for example, Thomas Nadelhofer, began working on this question and discovered something really striking. So a lot of times philosophers thought this sort of intuitive view, the view that most people would have, is incompatibilism. They think there's no way to have free will without um, if things are determined. And then philosophers who are incompatibilists and philosophers who are compatibilists often both shared this idea that, that incompatibilism is the intuitive view. So incompatibilist philosophers would say what people intuitively think is totally right. And then compatibilist philosophers would say what people intuitively think is wrong. People are mistaken. This free will is actually compatible with determinism. In these early studies, Namias and colleagues really dealt a blow to that view about what's intuitive. So they created a whole bunch of different ways of describing what determinism is. And then in each case, tried to figure out whether people think that um, this thing, determinism, is incompatible with moral responsibility. So I'll just give you an example of one of their really beautiful studies. So in this study, there are no conditions. Everyone's just getting the exact same story. So participants are told, imagine a universe in which um, everything that happens at a later time can be completely predicted by things that happen at an earlier time. So there's this massive supercomputer. It takes in all the information about what's going on at an earlier time. And then it says thousands of years from now, this person, Jeremy, is going to be born. And then Jeremy's going to grow up and eventually on, you know, 2,224, he's going to, on June 1st, he's going to rob a bank. So then, sure enough, time goes forward, you know, it's, it's like thousands of years later. And then this person, Jeremy, is born and then he just does exactly what the computer predicted. He grows up, he decides one day to rob a bank and then he robs the bank. And then participants were asked, is Jeremy more responsible for what he did? And participants overwhelmingly answered yes. So even though people thought, were told explicitly that this is a universe in which everything that happens could be predicted by how things were thousands of years earlier, people just thought, that doesn't matter. You're still completely responsible for what you did, which seemed to suggest maybe the things weren't just the way philosophers thought. It wasn't that everyone just thinks incompatibilism is the intuitive view. Okay. And then, so they used other examples and scenarios and they found a similar sort of thing where there were higher rates of compatibilism than than we might've anticipated. Yeah. They had four different ways of explaining what determinism is. Like the one that I just told you, another one was imagine the universe keeps getting recreated, but every time it's created, it just goes through the exact same thing again. Like almost like Nietzschean eternal recurrence. No matter how you explained it, you always get the same result. Everyone says that if you do something and what you do is completely determined, it doesn't matter. You're still totally more than responsible for what you did. Okay. So that's, so the initial finding seems to overturn this presumption that I suspect a lot of philosophers might have that most ordinary people would favor incompatibilism. Uh, but you know, that was, that might've been the initial research I'm guessing. And I mean, I'm not, I'm kind of saying I'm guessing, but I've seen some of the research, but <laughs> what has happened in the ensuing years? I haven't looked at it in a few years, so maybe things have changed, but the story doesn't end there, does it? Like there's more no, research doesn't. that has followed up on that. You know, the thing that happened in this case is basically the thing that happened in every single case that philo- experimental philosophers have investigated some problem that philosophers are debating. Whenever we look at things that philosophers have debated for thousands of years, we find that kind of the philosophical debate is being recapitulated among ordinary people. The things that philosophers are confused about, ordinary people are confused about them. So there seems to be, just like there is in every other case, something drawing people toward the compatibilist view and something drawing people toward the incompatibilist view. And all studies that have been done on this seem to converge on that. But then there's a lot of debate about what's drawing people in each of these directions. But I'll just give you an example from one of our studies. So in work with the philosopher Sean Nichols, we randomly assigned people to a case where we give, where you describe this in a very concrete way or in a very abstract way. So we said, imagine there's this universe, universe A, everything in it 
is just completely deterministic. And then in one condition, participants were given a very concrete case, just like in the non yas studies. So participants were told, imagine there's this person in this deterministic universe. He falls in love with his secretary, so he decides to leave his wife and family. So he sets up an incendiary device in the basement to burn them all to death. Is that guy morally responsible for what he did? And in that condition, the concrete condition, participants just overwhelmingly say, yes, he's totally morally responsible for what he did. So, so far, just the same as the earlier result. And then the other condition, the abstract condition, we just asked people an abstract question. We said, there's this universe, universe A. Can anyone in universe A ever be morally responsible for anything they do? And then participants overwhelmingly say, no. So participants are saying in one condition, this one guy in universe A is morally responsible for what he did. And then participants in the other condition are saying, no one in universe A can ever be morally responsible for anything they do. So somehow it feels like there's some kind of division between what people think in the abstract and what they think in the concrete. And what, what do you think the implications of that are? Because, you know, we might have, we might have um, hoped for at least some sort of clean separation in people's judgments where maybe we don't expect unanimity, like 100% incompatibilism or 100% incompatibilism, but we might at least expect a kind of um, clean separation where people consistently favor one or the other. But it mm -hmm. looks like instead there's like this, if it's construed in one way, a lot of people break in one direction, but if it's construed in another way, they break in a different direction. And it could even be the same person giving these at least superficially inconsistent responses. So how do we reconcile that? Yeah, it doesn't seem very reconcilable. So I think you're totally right. One way you could have imagined it being is that it's a difference between people. Like half of the people are compatibilist and half of the people are incompatibilist. That doesn't seem to be what we're finding. We seem to be finding there's a conflict within each of us that each person is feeling drawn in some way to compatibilism and drawn in some way to incompatibilism. Like if you think about, if I just think about myself, I don't feel like I just myself feel that one of these is obviously right and the other is obviously wrong, but just the other people disagree with me. I just feel within myself, these two voices pulling in these two different directions. So like you said, a lot of research is about why? I mean, why are we being pulled in these different directions? What is pulling us in one way in the concrete case? And what's pulling us in, the, in one way in the abstract case? And then um, what a lot of experiments are working on is the question, what is that factor? What's drawing us in these different directions? Yeah, so I, I, I looked into this research probably, I guess, about six or seven years ago or so. And then that kind of, I, like, I just, my focus shifted towards my dissertation work, and then it just became all metaethics for the next several years. So I sort of stopped reading it right at that point, maybe around 2016, 2017, something like that. Uh, my impression at the time is that this remained very much an issue, like the compatibilist, incompatibilist literature was up in the air. And part of what I was seeing is, is both this and that frequently you would get one study would get the evidence in one direction and then another study would get evidence more favoring in a different direction and there was no resolution and it was just everything was a matter of dispute i i don't know if that's maybe you have a different impression that was my impression at the time um so first i guess i don't know if that is or was your impression and if so if you think things have changed since then yeah well i mean i definitely think that there's progress and that we there are certain things we know that we didn't know before and then we're continuing to know more and more stuff and people are agreeing about about more and more stuff. There's things that we really are learning. But if your hope is that we're going to be like, okay, now we've got it. We have the fundamental nature of the whole problem has been resolved and now it's over. It's not going to be like that. But I can talk about some of the things we learned. So I'll just give you a simple example. When we first discovered this abstract concrete difference, then there's a question arises, you know, what's causing the difference? And what we thought it was was people's kind of emotional reactions. So if you hear the story about someone burning his family to death, you have this emotional reaction to it. And um, by contrast, if you're just asked in the abstract, can anyone in this universe ever be morally responsible? You, you're answering that question in a very unemotional way. And then we thought maybe this kind of affective, emotional side of us is what's drawing us toward compatibilism. And then maybe this kind of cool calculating reason, logic part of our mind is drawing us toward incompatibilism. So as for that, it's been completely resolved. We are definitely wrong about that. There's no further debate. That just turned out 
to be totally false. So there are all sorts of different studies and they all converge on the idea that that is not true. So just to give one example, there are people who have certain kinds of deficits that lead to um, a deficit in emotional responding. So for example, people who have the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, they have a deficit in the normal capacity for emotional response. And if you give them moral questions where emotional this kind of emotional response is playing a, norm, a really important role in people's ordinary way of responding, they give different answers to those questions. If you give people with a behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, these cases, the ones that I just described, there's no difference. They just respond exactly the same way that you or I would. So just as an example of one of the pieces of information that seems to shed light on this, whatever is going on in what you think about the guy with the incendiary device, it doesn't seem to be driven by your emotions. All right, so that's cool. I don't even know if I've seen that research, but you know, I think it's it's interesting. I maybe to to pause here to address this interesting way of making progress for a moment, which is that I think if if anybody had hoped for these sort of clean, easy, decisive, quick answers, like we run a survey and then we just get the answer resolved like that, done, um, that I think would have been too optimistic from the very outset. I mean. That has never been the case with the history of psychological research more generally, and issues turn out to be more complicated. And this looks like a case where, uh, you know, converging on the correct answer as to what's going on and why it's going on requires an iterative process of, of de developing hypotheses and then, in this case, falsifying them by devising the appropriate studies where you could basically ask this, this sort of... Um, this conditional question, conditional on this hypothesis being true, what sort of expectations should we should we have to observe? Like, if affect is accounting for this, then we should ex we shouldn't we shouldn't expect people that have some sort of suppressed affect to respond in exactly the same way. If they do, that's inconsistent with the hypothesis. We do find that, so that hypothesis is out. And then it, so you know, I guess so. There's that, and then there's just more generally. Um, I think people, especially philosophers, they're often working with these dichotomous or trichotomous, like there's this position or that position. And a lot of the emphasis could in principle have just been on do people favor this position or that position. But I think what we found, uh, and maybe you, you, you could certainly comment on this because I'm just commenting on my own impression of this as someone with both a background in psychology and philosophy is that things are much more complicated because there's not just the question of what is the pattern of response, but there's a question of what are the psychological mechanisms causing the pattern of response and often even the exact same pattern of response, like people lean towards um, incompatibilism in abstract cases um, and then compatibilism in concrete cases, even a pattern like that, um, it's not like you just identify the pattern. There could be a dozen possible psychological explanations for why, and it could even be multi-causal where it's actually a little bit of this mechanism and a little bit of that causal factor and it, like working out which how much each contributes to it can be super complicated. So yeah, I guess I'll just throw those thoughts at you and see what you say about those. Wait, I very strongly agree. I feel like that is um, a real difference between how my field is perceived from the outside and what it actually is. So I feel like on the outside, it's almost perceived as like um, the, this this kind of thing where y you would, um, we're, we're just gonna come to some, like run a poll and then we're gonna be like, on the whole, people think the answer is A, but it's never that. That's never what we're doing. Just finding out, I don't know what on the whole, what do the majority of people think? Like if you could be like, do the majority of people approve of Biden's presidency or something like that? What we're always trying to explore is why people think the things they do. And in the case of these really enduring debates within philosophy, it's almost never the case that people do have a kind of stable view about them. People feel pulled in different directions. And then we're just trying to understand why people feel pulled in these different directions. I don't know if this will be helpful in terms of that question, but one thing that's been very striking about this fact that people are torn is that that quality of being torn seems to be really universal. It's not something about our culture. So in a really nice study by Hanukkah and colleagues that came out a few years ago, they looked at people in all different regions of the world, you know, people in the United, in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, in South America. And what they find is across all of these different cultures, 
people are torn when it comes to the question of free will. They sort of feel kind of drawn toward incompatibilism and sort of drawn toward incompatibilism. And they're torn to the same degree. There's not even a difference in the percentage of people giving these different responses. So there seems something like really fundamental about us that's drawing us in these different directions. And then the key question, like you said, is why? And then I don't know, hopefully we'll make some progress over time in figuring out why. Yeah, I, you know, the thing about that kind of discovery that that non-philosophers um, are torn or ambivalent or give mixed responses, that sort of thing, is that, you know, it, that I don't think what really good evidence of that should be uh, in hindsight all that surprising given that philosophy is pretty much characterized by seemingly intractable disputes that have been really recalcitrant to any sort of resolution for so long. I mean, it, maybe it would have been really surprising and interesting if we found lots of non-philosophers just sort of like, yep, it's this. It's like 95% are just, we're, we're in this camp and we're really stable and consistent about it. And then philosophers aren't. Maybe that would be really troubling if we had found that. But it's really interesting that you say that. I agree with you that I think looking back, there was already so much reason to think it would turn out this way that it turned out that if you just go into a philosophy classroom, you introduce one of these questions, you don't find everyone just immediately converges toward one answer. You find people are really confused about it. And then the result we're getting is that people are indeed really confused about it in exactly the way you think. But even though I totally agree with you that there was already so much reason to think it would come out this way and it just came out the way we already had so much reason to think it would come out, what people have been saying about each of these issues in the existing literature was the exact opposite of it. So when it comes to free will, people were saying that ordinary folks are incompatibilist. When it comes to questions about the mind-body problem, people were saying that ordinary folks are dualist. When it comes to questions about metaethics, people were saying ordinary folks believe in objective moral truths. We didn't ever found any of those things to be true. We always found, with regard to all of those questions, that ordinary folks are confused. They feel torn in different directions in just the way that philosophers are torn in different directions. But for each of those issues, there was that kind of the official uh, philosophy view about which is supposed to be, I don't know, kind of the ordinary perspective. Yeah, it's something, uh, you know, this is, this is where my own research approach comes in, which is very critical of not, I guess you could say non-empirical philosophy, because, you know, when I got into um, experimental philosophy, I got into it as a graduate student. And I, my honest impression is there were a few people that were kind of like, yeah, it's cool, it's interesting, let's see what it'll do. Uh, and it had only been a, around for about 10 years but there was quite a bit of hostility or disinterest. I don't want to get too much into the sociology of philosophy, but um, I had that, that kind of reaction, which is this isn't going to be a very informative or illuminating approach to philosophy. And I have not had that impression at all. It's, I, it remains to me as exciting as, and as interesting as it was when I started, in spite of where my own research has gone, which is shifted towards methodology of experimental philosophy. I still think it's it's a great way to do things. Um, but I have noticed that, that there's this tendency for philosophers um, to have almost like a two layers of attitude about things. And there, there's a sort of superficial layer, which is most people are realists. Most people have qualia intuitions. Most people think this way. And that you'll see throughout the literature It'll be stuff like this is counterintuitive or this is the common sense view as if there were and is expected to be and, and like as if everybody agrees with that argument that there is a single uniform um, common sense view. But then in my conversations with philosophers, and I mean ones that are not really into experimental philosophy, if I talk to them about this and I say, oh, but maybe it's like mixed or it's pluralistic or people's views are complicated, they'll be like, well, of course, of course, why would it be otherwise? So. <laughs> What, what? So, so it's strange. It's like people acknowledging every, it, you know, it, cause people, philosophers love to use the chocolate and vanilla uh, division. It would be like if we kept seeing papers where they're like the, the common, the common preference is chocolate. The common preference is chocolate. And you see that everywhere. And then you go and talk to people writing these papers and they're like, well, of course, lots of people like chocolate, lots of people like vanilla. <laughs> some people kind of want some on some days and some on another. And it's really, and it's like, well, then why did you say everybody likes chocolate? That's really good. <laughs> That's Have totally you noticed this? Wait, that's totally right. I agree. That's really funny. Yeah. And so, oh, sorry. yeah, no, I, so there's something strange about that where it, I don't, I could say, oh, well, philosophers keep writing this thing of assuming everybody likes chocolate. 
And then they're not even appreciating that that's not how people are. But then if I actually talk to them, they do totally appreciate that. And then I don't even know what to do with that. That's really funny. I, I feel like about what you're saying, I feel like the more people do empirical research, I feel like the more they tend to say a certain thing, which is which is something kind of like, I don't know. So if you if you ask people who are really invested in this empirical research, what's the right answer to this question we've been talking about, about how to understand people's free will beliefs? I feel like you would overwhelmingly get, I don't know. You would, very few people would say, I totally know the answer. It is this. Everyone who thinks the opposite is wrong. And then it, it feels like it's something about engagement with this empirical research that draws people ever farther toward uncertainty. And then the farther you get from that, the more you can be like, this is it. We know the answer. It's this. But of course, within our uncertainty, we are learning things like that we know more than we did five years ago. Certain things that we thought might be right five years ago, we're like, those probably aren't right. But of course, we're always very, you know, we're never going to be like, okay, now we've got it. It's, it's over. Yeah, awesome. Let's move into another topic then. So we've talked about free will, uh, and this is one that I haven't really talked much about, but it is of interest to me. I've seen talks on it. I've read papers on it, but I never, I haven't talked about it on my channel, uh, which is personal identity. Can you introduce us to that research in yeah. next slide? Absolutely. So, so the question about personal identity is a really straightforward one. The question is, um, consider um, some, if you are lucky, you know, 20 years ago, 20 years from now, there'll be this person around who has the special property, the property of being you. Like that person will be Lance. And now the question is, what, what makes that person be you? So that person will be really different from you in all sorts of respects. Which thing about them makes that person be the person that you are now? Makes that person be you? Makes that person be a continuation of you? And within the philosophical literature, there have been all sorts of different views about what's the answer to that question. So just to give some examples, some people have said, it's fundamentally something kind of biological. It's that that person is going to be the same animal that you are, has the same body that you do. And other people have said, for example, that it's something psychological, that that person has this continuity with you at the level of psychology. They, there's something continuous about with them and you involving memories and desires and values and so forth. A very difficult question to figure out what the answer to this is. And then Within experimental philosophy, there's been these really surprising recent studies that seem to suggest really interesting things about ordinary intuitions regarding this question. Okay, uh, ha have you done any research on this or, or? Oh, only a little bit. I wouldn't say okay. that I'm one of the major players in this. I mean, I just thought it would be really interesting to talk about some of the work that other folks have done. People cool. have okay, so with, if there's like one example of a paper sure. or a study, could you run us through that? Yeah, I think a really, good way into this question is by thinking about this paper that's been very influential by the philosopher Kevin Tobia. So he told participants, okay, is there going to be two conditions again, just like in so many of the examples I gave earlier? In one condition, participants are told, imagine this guy Phineas. So he um, uh, he's a really kind person who's always helpful to others and always just going out of his way to be responsible and do things that make other people's lives better off. One day he's working on the railroad and he's trying to hammer in a spike and the spike goes right through his skull, damages his ventromedial prefrontal cortex. After the accident, there's this person who's there, but that person is really different. Where the original Phineas was so kind and helpful to others, this new person is really cruel, irresponsible, super mean to other people. And now the question is, what, what would you say about that person, the person after the accident? Would you say, that person is Phineas? Or would you say, you know, ultimately, that person's not even Phineas at all. Fundamentally, Phineas doesn't even exist anymore, and that's just a different person. Okay, now consider this other case. It's the reverse of the other case. So in this new case, participants are told, imagine there's this guy, and he's a really cruel, irresponsible person, always just trying to harm others and never doing anything to help others. One day, he's working on the railroad, and he like he's hammering in the spike, the spike goes through his skull, damages his ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And then when, when someone awakes after this accident, the person who's there after the accident is fundamentally different. This person is super kind to others, always trying to help people, incredibly responsible. Is that person, the person after the accident, really Phineas? Would you say that's Phineas? Or you say that's not even Phineas at all. Phineas is basically gone, and that's another person. And Tobia observes a really big difference between these two conditions. Participants are much more likely in the first case to say, 
that's not even Phineas anymore than they are in the second case, where they just say, it's still Phineas, it's just like a more awesome version of Phineas. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, I, that was already where, as soon as you're describing it, I'm like, oh, I know how this is going to go. Yeah, exactly. Um, you feel it. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it, it once you you describe it, you can kind of see where where it's going to go, um, which is an interesting question in and of itself. Like that kind of meta question of why does why does it jump out at you that that's that's mm -hmm. what you should find. Um, so what's interesting about that is that it's not just looking at sort of you could say intuitions about personal identity or something like that, but it's it's finding this difference. And then the the interesting question is why is there that difference? Yeah, it's a really good question. Why is there that difference? So we don't know the answer to that question, but let's start pursuing it a little bit further. So one possible thing you might think is it only happens for judgments about the self, like for human beings. But we find that it also arises for other things, other than human beings. So suppose it's not a human being, it's like a scientific paper. So it's like this paper, instead of Phineas, it's like a paper. It has, it has three experiments in it. And now imagine... The first experiment is just really amazing. It just like, gives you so much new insight and creativity and really takes things in this important new direction and reveals something truly important. And then, then experiment two is just some annoying thing that was put in to appease the reviewers and it just adds nothing to our understanding of these issues. Now, imagine that the authors are, um, are revising. So they're gradually taking things in and adding things and so forth. And then over time, the, this manuscript is changing. And now imagine in one case that eventually they just remove experiment two. So now only experiment one is in the paper. And then participants are asked, is it still the same paper? Just a, you know, a different version of the paper? Or is this fundamentally just a different paper? The original paper is now gone. And the participants in that case say, this is just basically the same. It's still the same paper. It's just like a different version of that paper. Now, by contrast, suppose you remove experiment one, but you keep experiment two. Then participants say, the original paper no longer exists. This is just a different paper. So we seem to be getting that same thing that sort of um, people think the very essence of the paper is the good parts of the paper. And you could imagine the same thing, I don't know, for like a band. Imagine that there's like a band that has different members, but all the actual artistic value has to do with one of the members and these other ones are just there. If the, if the bad members leave and are replaced by other members, people would be like, it's still basically the same band. But if the good members leave, people would be like, the band is over. There's not even the same band anymore. This is just a different band now. Yeah, I wonder, so you might think of a, like a, a band where there's a, a really iconic, say lead singer or lead guitarist or something like that, where if you remove them, people say it's no longer the same band. Mm -hmm. um, but if you remove a bunch of members of the band that most people are not familiar with, they might not think that. But I wonder if the fact, and maybe there's already research in this, what if it's a band that there is a single really iconic like, singer or something, but the the participant in the study really hates the music? Uh, <laughs> is that going to flip things? Wait, that's really helpful. Wait, I don't know if you think that this is that type of case, but consider our, um, our nation, the United States. So when our nation was born, there was this practice of slavery that was like enshrined in our constitution just this really horrible thing about our nation. And then, and then, you know, in the 1860s, things changed. There was these reformation amendments that the nation changed in a really fundamental way. And then one thing you might think, potentially you might think, I don't know, it's not even the United States anymore. The United States, like at the very essence of the United States is this horrible stuff like slavery. And then this is, this thing that exists now, it's not even the same thing anymore. Or you could think it is the same thing. This is this is it. This is our nation. And no, you could imagine it the other way. Like imagine things had just gone in the opposite direction. Our nation started like this, and then there was like some civil war, and then in slavery was enshrined in the constitution. And then would you think that just destroyed the nation? Like what this thing, this thing that's left isn't even the United States anymore. And at least on me, I get a real difference between those two. And this has this quality, I think, that you were looking for, that it's not some obscure thing that's just like in the background and no one pays any attention to. It's a really important thing about our nation. In these kinds of cases, people seem to have this feeling like even the bad things about our nation that are really important things about our nation in some sense of important, people seem to think, I don't know, it's not really what our country is about. 
if we could, that's not the essence of our country. If we could get rid of those things, we'd be more fulfilling, more fully embodying what this nation was really all about from the beginning. One moment. <laughs> My dog is barking. Give me one second. It's okay. You can go on. Okay. She wanted to go out. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. She she's super cute. I should I should bring her up here uh, so people could see her. Uh, so yeah, that is what I had in mind. Is that there's a distinction between what could be driving people's judgments, which is um, whether whether the characteristic in the case of a band it could be a person in the case of a country it could be policies or laws or cultural norms or whatever um whether it's seen as very very important for good or bad like it's mm -hmm. just a central part of the I identity of the thing in question or whether it is um something that is positively evaluated or negatively evaluated by the respondent and so their own personal appraisal is somehow the 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 deciding factor in whether identity is preserved when the change occurs. Yeah, we sometimes we are able if we really really try to get people to see something as fundamentally evil. So, in the case, for example, of our country, I think people who have opposite views about what's good or bad about our country, they have opposite views about sort of what's the essence of our country. That, see, Republicans and Democrats, they each think that whatever they think is the good stuff about our country, that's like what the country is really all about. And then the stuff that is the bad stuff about our country, that if we lost that, we would be just more fully embodying what this country is really all about. But we are sometimes able to get things to go in the opposite way. So we told people in one study, you know, imagine there's this um, university in Nazi Germany, the Iselon Institute. And then in, in, this, um, in this vignette, we said, you know, they teach like math and physics and that kind of stuff. And then they also teach um, Nazi ideology. And then on one condition we said, you know, but when people really get to know this institute, they get the sense, I don't know, they just have to teach this Nazi ideology because that's the law. But the thing they really care about is like teaching people about mathematics and so forth. And in the other condition, the opposite, that when people really get to know this thing, they realize this um, stuff about math and whatever is just protectual. It's basically just an attempt to teach Nazi ideology. And then we do get the opposite to happen, that people think, for example, in the second case, if they decide to just give up on teaching any academic subjects and just preach Nazi ideology full time, it would still be the Iselon Institute. But if they gave up on um, teaching Nazi stuff and only taught math all the time, fundamentally the Iselon Institute would be gone. So in that type of case that I just gave, maybe you can't get this to happen for humans, but people think that could be good and bad things about something but it could be that the bad things are the real essence of it, what it's really truly about. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense. What I find interesting about this though, is that this is a little different from the compatibilism, incompatibilism case, which in that, in that case, there was a sort of traditional dispute going on in philosophy between compatibilists and incompatibilists. And then the empirical research is directed at trying to figure out which way people tended to fall. Whereas in this case, my initial impression would be that theories about personal identity, like, you know, assuming that, you know, some people might think there is no continuity of identity, but if you grant, if you think, okay, there is preservation of identity of some form, then the question is, well, what is the best account of what it is about people or institutions or nations or whatever it is that preserves their identity, even, you know, objects uh, like the ship of Theseus type scenarios um, that the, those sorts of accounts don't, I, I don't think philosophers have typically had them be based on tracking our personal normative evaluations of the qualities of like the essence of the thing. And so in this case, it looks like the way that people who are you know not formally trained in philosophy, the kinds of distinctions that we're finding are not ones that I, I would have thought philosophers would be disposed to endorse on reflection. Am I, am I right about that? And if so, what, what might be the implications of that? Well, I, I really strongly agree with the point that you're making about the difference between how the, these different things relate to the philosophical tradition. And then I feel like you see a really clear trajectory in this empirical research. So people like me, I, I'm very much coming out of this philosophical tradition. I mean, I was like trained on this stuff. I spent all this time, you know, reading Aristotle and Spinoza and whatever. And then when I come to, a, to think about, you know, what should we study in ordinary folk intuitions, then 
the very first thing I think of is just the thing that people have been studying, thinking about all along, that philosophers have always been wondering about. And then, um, so that's always kind of what's first. Like the first thing to mind is, I don't know, let's just go after this using the kind of concepts, frameworks, theories that we've just inherited from traditional philosophy. But then as people keep exploring these things, then people start to discover new stuff that's not just rehashing on a, in an empirical way the kinds of questions that have been always the questions for hundreds of years in philosophy, but thinking about new questions that really don't relate to the traditional questions of philosophy. And that's exactly what happened in the case of personal identity, that the very first personal identity research that was run, it was very much just the same old stuff. It was like the things that philosophers have been discussing for hundreds of years ago, for hundreds of years. And then over time, as people kept delving into it, these things like the Tobia thing that I just told you about, where we're looking at moral judgments and how they affect personal identity judgments, these things start to happen that people start thinking, wait, we're just, we have the, our own questions that are not the traditional philosophical questions. We're just going to go after those. And then sometimes you see this thing happening in the other direction then that people who have been exploring these philosophical questions, you know, for in a very traditional way for a long time, like the great philosopher Maria Schechtman, then start philosophizing about these things that are coming out of this empirical research. And then, you know, you're seeing like this back and forth, but it's not um, just in one direction that these frameworks are coming out of traditional philosophy and then just being explored empirically within experimental philosophy. Yeah, this has been one of my own critiques of the presumptions behind a lot of the research in metaethics, which I think we could shift to next, which is that I, I make this distinction in the stuff I've written about this between what I take to be uh, top-down approaches and bottom-up approaches. So a lot of the, the way that experimental philosophers have sort of interfaced with the empirical literature is to take the existing categories and distinctions in, you could say, like analytic philosophy, and then they'll take compatibilism, incompatibilism, and then design studies with the, the measures designed to elicit whether you're one or the other. And then, you know, that is not necessarily too self-limiting because they use enough scenarios and cases and different framings where we've identified the sorts of differences you've talked about, abstract versus concrete. Um, but it's possible that there could be fundamentally different ways that people with that are not within the analytic tradition, you know, which is almost all people in the world think that couldn't readily be picked up by by that sort of top down structure. And if you take a more bottom up sort of observational or descriptive approach, you could identify these or sometimes it just comes out of those experimental approaches anyway. And I think it's really interesting because in, in some cases, it might indicate that um, even in instances like you you have, have mentioned in the case of the compatibilist stuff where you're finding this everywhere, there could still be uh, divisions between the way philosophers think and the way non-philosophers think. It could be that something about training in philosophy, at least this is my view, maybe maybe you disagree or, di or agree, whatever, um, where maybe philosophy is in some way narrowing people's perspective and, and winnowing away the alternative possibilities that might have occurred to them prior to that training, but then they get the training and they're, they're basically taught, hey, you know, you're stepping into this tradition, we've got over 2000 years where it's A or it's B. So get in line, do you want to go with A or B? And then they're, <laughs> it, it's like they never, it never occurs to them, maybe there's C, maybe there's an alternative. I don't know. Do you yeah, I really that? strongly agree that when, when people start to think, um, the very first thought, you know, in this kind of chronological order of how people tend to do explore these things um, empirically, the very first thought they have is everyone said it's either A or B. So what do ordinary people think? Do they think A or do they think B? And then they just start running these studies that are very much coming out of that tradition. Like, okay, there are two boxes, which are people in? But then over time, as people start doing more and more studies, they're like, wait, this framework that we've inherited from the non-empirical literature, it's really not making sense in exploring what's going on in people's in ordinary intuitions. And then hopefully, you know, over time, we start to see, hey, what about C? C has never been explored at all within the, you know, non-empirical literature, but maybe C rather than A or B is the thing that will really help us understand what's going on in people's ordinary intuitions. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's move into metaethics. And I wanted to ask, can I can I tell you quickly how I got into it? Because maybe that would be helpful in setting the stage. Okay, so here, here's what happened. I ran into this paper by Richard Joyce, who, for people that don't know, is an error theorist. So Joyce thinks that when ordinary people make moral claims, they're trying to describe a sort of objective or stance-independent moral reality. 
but that since on uh, Joyce's view, there is no such reality, all of those claims are sort of systematically false. Kind of like if people were going around trying to say things about unicorns, well, unicorns don't exist, so all of those remarks are gonna be false. And there is this back and forth between Joyce and Stephen Finlay who rejects that view. And so I'm reading this back and forth between them. And one of them is trying to characterize ordinary language in this objectivist way, this stance independent way. And then Finlay is offering objections to that. And then Joyce offers a reply and Finlay offers a reply. And I, I remember looking at that and going, um, why couldn't it be that some people think one way and some people think the other way? Um, and so I started writing about this and then I came across this paper and I don't know if you've seen this paper, but I'm always referencing it to my audience. Cause like it's, it, it's the main, it's one of the main papers. There's several, quite a few actually that contributed to where I ended up going with my, my doctoral work, which is this paper by Michael Gill called, I think it's called indeterminacy and variability in metaethics. I always forget the order, but Gill basically looks at 20th century metaethics and looks at all these disputes like the Finlay and Joyce dispute. And it's like, hey, here's one possibility. Maybe sometimes people mean one and sometimes people mean the other, and they don't all mean the same thing as one another, which he calls the uniformity and determinacy uh, assumption. And I just saw that and I was like, yeah, that that is what I think is going on here. And I think it's so interesting that it took a paper, this paper came out in 2009. I don't, I haven't seen a paper before. Maybe there, maybe there is one, I haven't read every paper, <laughs> but it took until the 21st century for someone to say, maybe some people mean one thing and some people mean the other. I just found something really strange about that and in the case of metaethics, but I think that that might generalize. Awesome, wait, Lance, can you tell, talk a little bit about your own findings? Like, so what did you end up doing? Sure, so what ended up happening is that that research um, in metaethics kind of mirrors the emergence of experimental philosophy. Now, actually, I'll mention this because I think it's really cool. Um, there is, there's actually a little bit of metaethics in the history of developmental and experimental psychology more generally. So if you look at like Kohlberg and some other people there, they did factor some metaethical considerations into their approach to these sorts of things. Um, I, I can't really get into that because that's a little bit too complicated, but really explicit, I guess you could say structured attempts to quantitatively evaluate the proportion of you could say folk realism and anti-realism in the population. There's actually a paper that goes all the way back to way before the emergence of experimental philosophy from 1983 from this uh, this uh, author trainer that has a meta ethics scale. And I saw almost nobody's ever cited it. And it's just, there's this meta ethics scale out there that no one has heard of that like predates experimental philosophy by almost 20 years. It's very cool, no one's mentioned it. So I wrote a little bit about that scale in my dissertation. Here's the cool thing. It's a pretty good scale. I like it. Uh, I say critical things about it, but it's for a first attempt. It is. It's. It's really neat. Um, and so I think. And I think that research was done in Australia. Uh, and the also the interesting thing, the data is all mixed. People's answers are all over the place. It's super super interesting. Anyway, but the research didn't pick up uh, until the early two thousands. But the paper that uh, really seems to have gotten the ball rolling is a paper by. Um, uh, Goodwin and Darley from 2008. And that paper was the first uh, to, well, I mean, I don't know, I don't know that it introduced the, what I call the disagreement paradigm, but it, it, for whatever reason, that paper, people started reacting to it, responding to it, and things just picked up. I don't know why, but that's what happened. So the main thing that they introduced there is what I call the disagreement paradigm. I think that name has sort of been uh, taken up in the literature. And the way that that works is that you give people a, a disagreement. So I'll simplify it because the way that they set it up is a little more complicated, but roughly it, it would work something like this. Alex and Sam disagree about abortion. Alex thinks that abortion is morally wrong. Sam thinks that abortion is not morally wrong. Do you think, and this would be the question you pose to the participant, do you think Alex and Sam can both be correct? Or do you think at least one of them must be incorrect? And what's going on with that question is if you say Alex and Sam could both be correct, that could be taken as either relativism specifically or at least some type of moral anti-realism because it looks like you're saying, hey, this claim, abortion is morally wrong, it could be both true and not true at the same time. Whereas if you say at least one of them must be incorrect, that's taken to be an indication that you think that there's only a single, uh, presumably objectively correct fact of the matter about the question of whether abortion is morally right or wrong. And that could be interpreted as an indication of realism. And so that the, this disagreement paradigm 
is designed to determine whether a person's a realist or anti-realist. Where my research came in is that answers to this question are really mixed. So if you ask people about an issue there where there's a lot more cultural controversy about it, like abortion, where people are split, at least in the United States, they're, you know, I don't know exactly what the proportion would be around the world. Um, you get a much higher anti-realist response um, where people give the, the seemingly relativist response where they say both could be correct. But if it's something like murder or it's a really serious, terrible action, then you get a very low rate of people saying both could be correct. And so that's already an interesting finding. It looks like people are realists about some moral issues and anti-realists about other moral issues. Uh, and that already seems totally out of accord with the history of how philosophers have discussed these issues because anti-realists and realists in the analytic philosophical literature, they're, I've never heard of one saying, well, maybe some issues there's a realist answer and some issues there's an anti-realist answer. There are some, some interesting hybrid accounts, but they don't typically have quite that, that piecemeal structure where it's on an individual issue basis for the exact same population. So I guess I could pause there just because I've sort of framed what's going on in the literature. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, well, to me, it feels like there's now really strong evidence that this thing that you said is true. So there, I feel like I've never seen any evidence against it. Every time that people study it, they get that same effect. There's always that this sense that people think, as for murder, it's like objectively morally wrong. And as for abortion, there's no objective truth. It could be that different people have different opinions. There's no fact of the matter. And then the big question is why? Why is there this difference? Right. And so here's, yeah, so there's a paper by Wright, Brangie, and McWhite, which attempts to rule out one possible explanation. So here's one thing you might think. You might think, well, huh, maybe there is individual variation in which issues the participants consider to be moral. Because keep in mind that the researchers themselves just give people, you know, 15 issues that they classify a priori as moral issues. But what if the participants don't see the issues as moral? And if you ask the participant to classify the issues, and let's say one person says, yeah, I agree, all 15 are moral issues. But another says, no, only these 10 are, are moral. If you look at just the ones the participants consider moral, maybe then you would get a consistent response from people. Maybe it'd be everybody gives the realist response for moral issues. And then the anti-realist response are actually only emerge in the cases where it's not a moral issue. And so they did that. They asked people to classify the issues. They The pattern barely changed. And so that didn't explain what was going on here. So that was an early, and, and that was a response to the Goodwin and Darley paper. And they're like, hey, maybe we'll find this, there really is a, con a consistent pattern. Nope, they didn't find that. Um, subsequent studies, I, as I've never seen a study that finds a super duper consistent response. There is one exception, and it's a really interesting one, um, which is a uh, paper by uh, Polsler and Wright, which is called Anti-Realist Pluralism. Now notice, they maintain that pluralism is in there. But um, the pluralism uh, that they find is largely, uh, so there's two different types of pluralism in the meta-ethics literature. There is interpersonal, and this would be one person is more consistently a realist, another person is more consistently an anti-realist. But then there's intrapersonal, which is a person is a realist or gives a realist response about some moral issues and then gives an anti-realist response about other issues. And what they find is a little bit less of the second one, but there's a specific and interesting reason why I think that they find that. What uh, Pulzer and Wright have done in their work is they have been at the forefront of identifying some of the confounds and methodological issues with some of the earlier studies. So there were some instructions that could have been a little, um, a little improved. They improved on the instructions. It's also possible that the response options were a little too limited and vague. And so they fleshed out the response options. They gave a kind of, uh, they gave different anti-realist responses. So you could give the response that a relativist would give, uh, you, whether you're an individual subjectivist or a cultural relativist. They actually have different answers for those. Because one of the things they pointed out is, you know, for instance, um, if you say, hey, Alex and Sam disagree about abortion, do you think they could both be correct? And, um, or do you think at least one has to be incorrect? What if you're a cultural relativist and you're thinking, well, they're from the same culture. So one of them's got to be incorrect relative to the same cultural standards. Well, now you could give a su supposedly realist response, but you're actually a cultural relativist and you're not a realist. Um, and so that's that's a problem for those studies. So what they do is they introduce um, more robust responses, uh, more detailed and clearer instructions. And then they also gave people um, what I, I call them this, maybe Pulsar and Wright wouldn't like this, but they, uh, I call them training exercises. 
where they introduce the participants to, for instance, the distinction between propositions and non-propositional utterances like, ow, you know? Uh, so they get a bit of training and then they have classification exercises where they're given exercises to, they have to classify properly. And so with training, improved instructions, extra detailed uh, instructions, extra detailed response options and all that, what they then find is that you get a much greater degree of stability in people's responses. And then you don't, this, you still get substantial interpersonal variability. About three quarters of people in their, their studies favored the anti-realist response, which is interesting. Um, and only a quarter favored the realist responses, which is still not nothing. That's a lot of people. Um, but they had very little inconsistency for the same participant across abstract and concrete um, paradigms. And they used a variety of different paradigms and they still found the consistency. So there's something interesting about that. I don't, do you have thoughts on that? Wait, I'm struck by the interpersonal consistency, but I'm even, relatively speaking, I'm even more struck by like, why is this happening in the first place? Why is there a difference between the controversial and non-controversial items? So what what have you yourself, like, can you talk about your own findings? Sure, sure, I could pivot to that. And it is relevant to this because I have stuff to say about the study. So if we go back to the Goodwin and Darley stuff, I took a very different approach to the approach Polzer and Wright take. My approach was to ask this question of, why did the participants respond the way that they did? And one of the things that was really awesome about the original Goodwin and Darley study is that they asked people some open-ended questions where they could write in their explanations. And one of the things they asked people is, hey, uh, and in their study, it wasn't like Alex and Sam disagreed. What they did is they told the participants that they gathered data in a previous study about the same question and that a previous participant, so an actual person disagreed with them. I like that because it's it adds an element of there's actual stakes here. There's a person that disagrees with you. It's not hypothetical. I do like that. On the other hand, if I'm told that a previous participant thinks that murder is okay, I might be like, oh, come on, really? I don't, come on. So you could have that where it's really implausible for some issues and maybe more pl more plausible for other issues. And maybe that's driving the responses in that case. So you gotta be, you gotta worry about whether you use a first person version of this where it's you and another person or a third person version where it's two hypothetical people. I think there might be advantages to the hypothetical approach, which is you could just imagine hypothetically a person is okay with murder. And maybe that doesn't have quite the resistance that you would get if it's supposedly a real person thinks murder is okay. Anyway, so they asked people why they thought that people disagreed and they had given their, they had given an analysis of that and they had a very low rate of this being any sort of issue for the validity of the measure. But I asked them for the data and uh, uh, Goodwin gave me the data and I had to look at it myself. I had a, uh, another colleague look at it and we coded the data for um, what the people attributed the cause of the disagreement to. And our own analysis, um, we disagreed with them, which you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that they shared the data, especially when we ended up criticizing it. Uh, but what we found is that there were lots of responses that we did not take, and this is my colleague, David Moss, and we have a paper on this called Misunderstanding Metaethics, and that's um, with both of us on that paper. And um, what we found is that people would attribute the source of disagreement to factors that we did not think were an indication that they took the dispute to be a genuine dispute about different moral standards. So the kinds of things people might say instead, you had a couple people that would say, well, the other person must have misread the question which if, if you think the other person didn't even disagree with you, they just misunderstood the question. Now your response is not really going to be an indication of your metaethical view. We don't know anymore whether it tells us. So it doesn't mean it proves it's not a metaethical view. We just don't know what your response means. Um, but people would often just say stuff like, well, the other person's a bad person, and which is there's interesting parallels of both the um, compatibilist, uh, incompatibilist research you mentioned and the personal identity stuff. And this is a, a potential concern, which I call a normative confound. Uh, and this is something that Pulsar and Wright talk about in their papers as well, which is that one of the issues that can happen is if you tell me another person disagrees with me about abortion or murder or, or stealing or something like, let's say I think stealing is wrong and you tell me another person thinks stealing is not wrong. And then you ask if we could both be correct. I might say, well, no, they're incorrect. But if that's the case, am I reporting my normative moral standard? Because if you're asking me, do I think stealing is, is both correct and incorrect? I'm gonna say, no, I think it's incorrect. It's not, it's wrong to steal. And so it could be that the participants were just interpreting the question as a kind of another way or a recapitulation of asking them about their normative moral standards, not their meta-ethical standards. And I think that's a big factor. 
So um, what I did after that is, in addition to that, is I started gathering my own data. So I started giving people the disagreement paradigm and then asking them a variety of questions about it and then using open response. And I also used multiple choice questions. So what I ask them are questions like, um, I would give them a person's answer. So a person, so I give them the Alex and Sam question. And then I say, another respondent said, yeah, they're both correct. Or another respondent said, at least one of them is incorrect. What do you think the respondent means by that? So we're getting very meta, right? Now I'm asking about a participant's response to another participant's response to a question. So that's one thing I ask. I also ask them, what do you think this question is asking you? And mm -hmm. then I would ask them to answer the question and then say, why did you answer in this way? And then for all of those questions, and I, I have other paradigms too, if we have time to talk about them. What I did is I coded them um, with uh, David Moss um, and I both uh, coded these. I had another coder for some of the other data. And what we did is we coded them for two questions. Is their interpretation clear or unclear? And if it is, uh, regardless of whether it's clear or unclear, does it lean towards an intended interpretation of the question or an unintended interpretation of the question? And what you would hope for, for a like a good measure, a valid measure, is that you have clearly intended interpretations of the question, meaning that people would say, uh, why did you answer this way? Well, uh, because I don't think that two moral standards could both be correct at the same time. Like it, it's very simple. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. They don't have to say, well, because I think that there are stance independent moral facts and therefore insofar as the other response indicates that there are no stance independent facts, it's like, they don't have to be sophisticated. They just have to give a response that's consistent with what the researchers are, are intending for them to interpret it as. But um, if they don't, it could be because it's unclear. And in that case, it's inconclusive. Or the worst case scenario, if you're hoping for valid measures is a clearly unintended response. And what we have found across a lot of these questions is that you get very low rates of clearly intended interpretations and you get alarmingly high rates of clearly unintended interpretations. And so my conclusion is that the measures that have been used, especially this disagreement paradigm, are just not telling us about people's meta-ethical views. And if we want to make progress, we're going to need to take a different approach. And there are new approaches. So when you say... Um that you're getting these unintended interpretations. You know how there are two possible answers they could give. They could give the more relativist sort of answer or the more objectivist sort of answer. Are, are they e equally having showing unintended interpretations for, for both of those answers or sort of asymmetrically more for one or more for the other? It, it varies by the type of question. Um, my general my general impression, um, I, I would have to look at the exact data to see all the proportions because I have something like 25 data sets. So you're going to get a lot of variation on this is that people struggle a lot more with objectivism than they do with relativism, um, that something about that seems to be uh, more difficult. I'd have to directly look at it um, to, to really see the proportions. But yeah, my general impression is that people um, have a tougher time with the notion of stance independence than they do with various anti-realist responses. Cool, so on the other hand, um, just real quick on that note, I have, uh, we did ask questions about um, where we took um, survey questions that ask about realism and then um, like some type of relativism and then non-cognitivism and non-cognitivism, we couldn't get consistent responses on that. So it looks like the non-cognitivism might be the di most difficult for people to, to grasp. And so that's one exception to that. So you see, it's complicated. Some anti-realist positions. So if you look at the hierarchy of what's understandable, it might be some anti-realist positions, then realism, and then other anti-realist positions. Awesome. Wait, so, but overall, you're coming to this kind of skeptical conclusion, not that that these data don't teach us anything. Like, we just have to start using some different method. Yeah, that's my conclusion. And um, so I propose in the dissertation a rather, I think, possibly alarming hypothesis, which I call, uh, well, I, I got it from Gill. So it was really Gill proposed this. So in Gill's original paper back in 2009, Gill proposes indeterminacy and variability. And variability is this view that has come in the, in the empirical literature to be called pluralism, that individuals, you have the interpersonal and the in, intrapersonal, and you have both of those forms, that there's variation between people, but also that the same person has realist standards towards some moral issues and, and anti-realist standards towards others. Gill actually proposes, and in the dissertation, I describe a variety of other types of, of variability. It doesn't have to be on a per issue basis. It doesn't have to be that, say, you're an anti-realist about abortion, but a realist about murder. It could be that you're a realist in some social contexts and an anti-realist in other social contexts. Mm -hmm. Maybe when a person goes to church, they shift towards more realist mindset. 
But then when they go to work, they shift towards a more anti-realist mindset. Could be something like that. And so Gill talks about these other types of variability. Uh, but there's two prongs to that hypothesis. It's indeterminacy and variability. And my interpretation of literature, and this isn't what I set out to find. This was my sort of, um, I, I don't want to say too grudging because I kind of like <laughs> where, where this ended up going. But I kind of fell into like, I think, I think there's something strange going on here. Here's, here's what I think is going on. I think it's the case that ordinary moral claims are neither driven by an implicit presupposition nor an intuition that determinately favors realism or anti-realism. I think non-philosophers are neither realists nor anti-realists. And that might seem really strange, but that's what I think is going on. And yeah. I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, can, can you keep going? Can you explain? Oh, sure. So I think that makes more sense of the data. And part of the reason I think it makes sense of the data is that if you get an inconsistent and incoherent and uh, uh, response from people, you could think um, maybe the problem is us as, as researchers, that we need to design better measures to elicit these responses from people. But it could also just be that you're trying to ask a question where there's just no way for a person to formulate an intelligible response because it's an issue that they haven't thought about. So in an attempt to show this, that is, it's a little bit satirical, but it is serious in, in what I end up doing with it, is um, so that the dissertation is called Schrodinger's Categories, which is a play on words. I, I guess I like play on words, Lance Independent, stuff like that. Um, and so the idea there is what it, the central metaphor is a comparison of quantum mechanics, where what I say is that for at least some philosophical issues, non-philosophers exist in a sort of philosophical superposition that's resolved by engaging in philosophy. And so they just don't have any particular view at all. And the only way to elicit a view is to get them to do philosophy. And prior to doing that, they could go either way. Uh, and so uh, that I think makes sense of the data. Now, what I try to do is I try to literally push the metaphor. And so I ran this study where I asked my participants, hey, do you have like training in physics and that sort of thing? And if they do, I, I exclude those from analysis. I also analyzed with them and it didn't substantially change the results. When you run online surveys, you do not get like a huge proportion of quantum physicists filling out your survey, fortunately for me, um, although it would be cool if you did. Uh, so you set aside people that actually have formal training and then you look at the response to this simple question. Do you have a settled view about how to interpret quantum mechanics like the Copenhagen or the many world view? Naturally, the answer is no, <laughs> people don't have a view about that. They don't know, they don't know what that is. Uh, and so, okay, so you have this group of people that say, yeah, I don't have a view about this complicated issue in theoretical physics, but then you say, okay, well, I'm going to introduce you to quantum mechanics, like very briefly, and then here's the Copenhagen interpretation, here's the many worlds interpretation, and now I would like to know which one of those views do you endorse, the Copenhagen or the many worlds? Do you want to take a guess at what most people favored for my study? Oh, I totally don't know. That's a great question. What's the answer? It's Copenhagen, because I think oh. many worlds... Um, uh, many worlds maybe sounds really weird because it's like whenever the super the wave function collapses, the universe splits into two, and now there's two universes. So mm -hmm. the universe is constantly branching into you know trillions and trillions of universes. Maybe that sounds super weird and science fictiony to people. Whereas saying yeah, it's basically random and the universe rolls dice every mm -hmm. time, maybe that seems more natural to people. Um, especially because I think people do not like determinism. Anyway, so most people pick Copenhagen, and then I ask a follow up question, and it's kind of a I, I don't want to say it's a trick question, but it's not a, it's not really fair because it's kind of win-win for my hypothesis. So someone needs to do better research, maybe critical research, trying to see if I'm wrong. But anyway, what I asked them is, did you feel like you were compelled to pick a response that didn't really reflect your views? And you get about 50-50 for people saying, yes, I did. And people saying, no, I didn't. But the problem is it's bad either way. Here's why. They already agreed they didn't have a view about the issue. Then they read about the issue and then they report a view. Now, if they say, the review, the view I reported is not my real view. Well, then it's not a valid measure because they don't actually think that I didn't give them the option to say, I don't know, or I'm on agnostic or I'm undecided. They only had the options to proceed with the study to pick one or the other. And if, if I say, Hey, what's your favorite color? Um, you know, purple or, or orange. And you're like, well, it's, it's blue. And I'm like, purple or orange, pick one. <laughs> you could say, I can't say, well, you know, 80% of people pick purple, therefore 80% of people like purple because they didn't have the option to pick blue or red or green or whatever. Um, so already that those people, that's not a valid measure. But then the other people, if they said, I do have a view, well, keep in mind, these very same people just reported that they didn't have a view before they got into the study. 
So did they form a view in the middle of the study? It looks like maybe they did. Now, there's a couple of things that could be going on. Maybe they're reporting that they formed a view, but it's transient and fleeting. And you know, a week later, if you ask them which answer they pick, they go, I don't remember, I don't know. And so in a certain sense, they're not really reporting a stable and robust view that they already held. Or it's possible they do form a stable and robust view. And you see, none of these options are good from the perspective of if you're if you think indeterminacy isn't an issue, because you have at least three possibilities here. Um, they are reporting a view that's not their real view. They're reporting a view that is now a stable view, but it wasn't previously. So they developed a view by participating in the study, or the view is an unstable, fleeting view that doesn't, it's not a stable feature. None of those are good for someone that is hoping to see people's like the folk view of quantum mechanics, because none of them are identifying a stable folk view that existed prior to participating in the study. And so what I propose is that measures are either invalid in this case, or they're the result of what I call spontaneous theorizing, which is a person forming a philosophical position, or in this case, a scientific position, by participating in the study. In other words, we've collapsed the wave function, the philosophical wave function, and they started doing philosophy. And this goes back to the Polzer and Wright stuff. Notice what I said about it. They give them training. They give them these robust questions. And so what concerns me about that is that those participants, I, I kind of see them like this study was supposed to tell us what non-philosophers think. But it's very difficult to tell what non-philosophers think by training people a little bit to do philosophy and then asking them the questions, because what if the training in philosophy causes the answer? Now you don't know if that's you cause them to give the answer or whether that was the answer they had all along. I don't know how to tell the difference. And that's I, what I think is the key problem. Well, I strongly agree with everything you're saying about what's going on in these studies, but I guess I maybe disagree with your pessimism that somehow you seem to feel like this is bad. It's like a problem with the studies. But I, I think exactly the same thing you do about what's happening in people's minds when they're taking the studies. But I guess I just don't see that as something bad about the studies. That's just the answer. Well, if that's the answer, that's the answer. But it's an interesting thing because I think there's a more fundamental question about what experimental philosophers are after. Um, you know, are they at, because some people will say things like, well, since most of the population are moral realists, or they speak or think like moral realists, we should expect to observe this certain sorts of social behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I see people comment on this. Well, what if people became anti-realists? Maybe they would act really badly. But if they're not realists or anti-realists, maybe those questions don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so that might be, there might be psychological implications that I would find interesting, but it does make me at least interpersonally a little uncomfortable because the direction of my research shifted towards saying, hey, I think there's validity issues with these other people's studies that you're not always very popular if you're telling other people you think their studies aren't telling them what they say they are. Oh, wait, um, so wait, that does make you worry. Wait, if you think there's a problem that involves something that's different between the studies, what the studies really tell people and what people say the studies are supposed to do, you could imagine either one being the, the culprit, the thing that's wrong. So one thing you could think is that what people said they were trying to do was totally right and they should change their studies. But then you could also think the other way, that these studies are great, everything's going well, they should just change their view about what the studies are supposed to do to fit what these studies really do. I vote for the second option, that there's nothing wrong with these studies. People thought initially that the studies were supposed to tell them this certain thing, and then they're not. The studies don't tell them the answer to that question that they thought the studies were supposed to tell them the answer to. That's not a problem with the studies. That's just a problem with the original question. Yeah, and that's what I'm getting at with, with being clear about what we're after. So oh, if yeah. we're after... Uh, this view about what view do people already hold, like an explicit theoretical perspective? And the answer is none. You could say, okay, well, maybe that was the wrong question to ask. You could just shift the focus of the question or maybe even recognize, huh, maybe it wasn't so clear on what I wanted to know all along. Maybe when we're talking about philosophical intuitions, we're not talking about explicit commitments. We're talking about a disposition to when you're exposed to a particular consideration, respond in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And that it can be in and of itself psychologically interesting in its own right. What if we found, for instance, that nobody has any determinate view about realism and anti-realism, but it, it, no matter how you explain it to them, as unbiased as possible, realists design the studies, anti-realists design the studies, we find out 98% of people always give the realist response. Is that not an important psychological discovery that people are extremely heavily disposed to give realist responses? I think it would be, even if 
folk indeterminacy is true, that's still an interesting finding. And, you know, you can make a comparison to saying, okay, well, let's say there's this like fruit or a new food that no one is like, there's an island, right? And it has a fruit on it. No one has tried the fruit before. Like it's an undiscovered island. Um, so psychological question, do people like the fruit or not currently? If you're thinking of it as like, do they think, oh yeah, the fruit is delicious. That's an absurd question. Nobody has tasted it. But there's still a question of, well, what's going to happen when people try it? Are most people going to like it or dislike it? And that's still going to tell us something about human psychology. So well, maybe that an analogy helps. Well, I agree. So suppose what's really going on in people's minds, well, this is the kind of view that I have about what's going on in people's minds in these cases, is that um, there's something drawing them toward um, the idea that there is subjective moral truths and something drawing them toward the idea that there aren't objective moral truths. And those are both real things within our mind. And then when you give them this question, like this disagreement paradigm, then somehow they have to choose. And then, I don't know, say it's like two thirds of them choose one thing and one third choose another thing. But then it's not that the two thirds are different from the one third, it's like different kinds of people. Rather it's that e each person really has these two different things within them and they're both real things within you. Then it doesn't mean that we should switch to other experiments where people have more determined answers. There's nothing wrong with the experiment. This was the right experiment and we just found the answer. The answer is that there isn't this kind of determined answer in the way that you were talking about. E each individual participant is kind of being drawn in part toward one answer and part toward the other answer. And that that's the answer. Now we found the answer to our research question. Yeah, so you can, you can do that framing. I will say though, that even if you continue with the research with that in mind, um, two things. One would be at least some of the claims made prior to recognizing that this is what the research is doing would still be mistaken. So if someone says most people are like explicitly endorse realism or they have realist phenomenology or something like that, that might not be true. Now the phenomenology question is just different from how people respond to questions about sentences. So that's one thing is that there's still gonna be people out there that prior to this research were making claims that are probably not correct because they were presuming that this was a pre-existing view and not a disposition to respond in a particular way. So there'll still be that. Uh, but then, uh, you know, my pessimism now has become pretty strong and maybe that's where you and I would be, have different views. Like you would be more optimistic about the prospects of this research. I'm a little concerned that um, it's not simply that people have a sort of, you could say almost intrinsic disposition. Maybe it's not intrinsic in some deep sense, but it's just that in virtue of shared features of human psychology, people are disposed towards realism in these cases and anti-realism in these other cases. I wonder about the degree to which the um, enculturation, the structure of our language, um, the particular ways the questions are framed, all of those factors are, are sort of shifting people in subtle and difficult to detect ways towards one or another answer. And so we're not really discovering these sort of shared features of human psychology, but we're discovering patterns in human psychology that emerge under inscrutable and highly variable um, causal factors that are are very contingent and difficult to pin down. I still think that's a psychologically interesting question though. So maybe I shouldn't be so pessimistic. I, I just think it's gonna make issues really difficult. Well, I don't know if we should call that pessimism or optimism, but I my read of the literature is just the exact opposite answer to this question. So, so one possible view you could have is that, um, for example, 21st century Americans just find these issues really confusing. And if you ask me, I'll be find it confusing. I'll be drawn in these different directions. But that has to do with these super contingent factor um, aspects of my cultural upbringing and the situation in which I, I'm embedded and so forth. Then another view is that there's some really profound sense in which these issues are confusing. They're not just confusing right now because of something about my education, upbringing, situation, and so forth they're confusing in a way that's really stable. The confusion itself is stable. And then if you look at existing studies on these issues, I think there's some evidence for that second one, for the idea that there's a really fundamental, something fundamentally confusing about these issues, something confusing about them because of how our minds work or something like that. Not, They're not confusing because of just unstable aspects of how things happen to be in our present situation. Yeah, I don't know the answer. So it could be it could be that there are these sort of e extraneous like environmental and cultural factors. I tend to lean in the direction of thinking those are quite significant, but they might not be. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not super duper committed to that one way or the other. For me, where I think that this research needs to go is to 
get more fundamental. And in a certain sense, you know, it's not like I, I reached this indeterminacy conclusion and then my, I think people might hear that and then go, oh, so you want to quit because there's no answer, answer to the question. Just quit, go do something else. That's not at all uh, what I think uh, should happen. I think that the question becomes so messy and complicated that addressing the question is going to be this really difficult project. Now, on the one hand, um, that might interest me because it means I get to have a career doing this. You know, if I thought the answer was solved, I'd have to go do something else. Uh, so it's good for me. Um, it's not good from the perspective of giving a clean and satisfactory answer to the people that in a certain sense I'm responding to. Uh, because now I have to do all this work and then it's going to be super complicated. And a lot of times other people are going to want clean and simple solutions. They're going to say, is it A or is it B? And I think that a lot of philosophical questions are going to come down to, in a certain sense, it's, you could say both, but in another sense, it might be neither. And we need to shift our perspective on how we address these questions. And I think that is where I'm going with this, where I'm starting to wonder, you know, about the, the very nature of hum, like human conceptualization, like how human, how concepts work, how judgment works. And if, if, um, our, the way that we conceive of more foundational questions is too discrete and categorical, and it's less fluid and improvisational. And for me, you know, after finishing up the dissertation, I ran into this book, The Language Game, and then I ran into this other book, The Mind is Flat, and it started to shift my interest in it towards these more foundational questions about language and cognition. And the, it's like this whole new world to me that's super duper interesting, but it makes addressing these questions re like really difficult. I feel like I have to shift the focus of the research itself. And there's something daunting about that at the very least. <laughs> I feel like this is a great, um, great conclusion to our conversation that you're totally right. That's exactly the thing that we need to be doing. And I feel like you and I are very much on the same page about precisely that. Yeah, I think so too. So I, maybe I'm more pessimistic than maybe that's my personality. Maybe you're more optimistic, but I will know, I, I know from your own work and maybe you could correct me if this is mistaken, but when you've characterized experimental philosophy, you, you basically said it, it's, have you not said something like it's like doing cognitive science? Yeah, the, the, my, this motto, experimental philosophy is cognitive science. And that seems yeah. to be very much the, the side that you're on. So that is the side I'm on. I'm very excited about that. I think maybe a lot of philosophers are not so much excited about it, but I think they should be. Wait, so, yeah, so, so we, we can be on it. team <laughs> indeterminacy and as well on team experimental philosophy as cognitive science. Yeah, so I think it falls very much in there. So I guess that has shifted my focus. Cool, okay, so um, that is a good place, I think, to wrap up, but I'd like to, to ask if you have any final commentary or thoughts. I know I ended up saying a lot towards the end of this conversation. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if this counts, but I, I really think that what you're saying to the end of the conversation is exactly right. That it's not that, first of all, it's not that people as a whole have an answer to this, to these questions that we're asking them that, I don't know, people as a whole think morality is that they're objective truths or that their morality is purely relative. But secondly, it's not that each individual person does. It's not that, for example, I don't know, 40% of the people think they're objective moral truths and 60% of the people think that it's that it's really relative. It's that the this um, problem that we see in the history of philosophy, this problem is being recapitulated within each individual person. That each individual person is feeling the kind of philosophical debate within themselves and feeling kind of caught between these different um, sides of these questions. And, as research on this stuff continues, we seem to be getting more and more evidence of that, that there's, there's a conflict that's going on, not just between different people, but within individual people. And it feels like it's that that's really coming out of your research on metaethics, but also something much more broad, something that's not just about metaethics, but about each of these other issues we've discussed about free will and personal identity and the relationship between mind and body and what happiness really is and all of these questions that philosophers have discussed. Yeah, I think there's something to that. <laughs> That's really cool. Awesome. So uh, thanks so much for, for you know, joining me. I, I know I have a pretty new channel, so I really appreciate you coming on here to talk about things. And Good I guess uh, thanks so much for being here. It was great talking with you. Thanks so much, Lance. Yep. All right. Take care, everybody.